I hope you'll open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 6. I want to thank again uh, Dr. Aiken, Dr. Ashford, and those who invited me to come. I'm uh, very grateful to Lauren for the work she did to make the arrangements. For those who picked me up and brought me around and took care of me, thank you very much. And, and uh, Zach, who made sure my voice could be heard without me losing my voice shouting, I'm grateful. Uh, it's been good to spend time with uh, the, uh, the PhD uh, seminar and luncheon yesterday and also to the uh, library uh, meeting yesterday. Um, for those of you who don't know where the library is, uh, I'm, I'm directionally challenged, but it's a big building with books and um, people and helpful people over there. So I hope you will uh, use that great resource. Yesterday I was giving a definition of the gospel that I think is shaped by the scriptures themselves, Isaiah and elsewhere, but thoroughly and fully in a big book like Isaiah with a great vision like Isaiah, but also uh, found certainly in the book of Romans, book of John and other places, a full bodied, complete uh, statement that God's good news is that God is the creator the sole God, and He is taking creation from its original flawless state through its current sin-marred state, as we know it now, on through then to its future final glorious state. We are headed somewhere as we do our ministry on this earth. He does this, this saving work, in a personal way, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the book of Isaiah, but particularly through His Son Jesus in the New Testament. Personal work, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, comprehensive work. It is for all peoples as we will see again today. It is for all places as we'll see again today. Having read Isaiah for, for quite a while, there's, this, there's there are several verses that say, God will indeed take His message to the coastlands which is the Hebrew Bible's way of saying just wherever you could imagine land and people. And I was struck and encouraged a few years ago, I, th I thought of this as we were singing this song. Uh, I, I remembered singing uh, Before the Throne of God Above with a, a group of Australians uh, in Sydney. And they said, where's your next stop? I said, I'm going to Perth, which is on the west coast of Australia. They said, Perth, why do you want to go there? A bunch of have never been to Perth. Um, and I said, well, you know, I want to see that the gospel has gone to the coastlands, to the end of the earth, because Perth is known as the most isolated city on earth. And I got out there, sure enough, the gospel had gone there, to Perth, to the ends of the earth, to all places. And this comprehensive work, all creatures, all things, it's redemptive from sin and decay. Now that's what we preach, and we particularly preach it, the redemptive work, uh, in Isaiah through passages we're going to look at today, through the servant of God who's died, as we sang. That redemptive work, however, is shared with us, God's servants. He gives us work to do, which is awfully good news. That there is meaning, and there is responsibility, and there is challenge. And there is also, therefore, sorrow and struggle as we work for God to bring others and ourselves to God's Zion. And part of what I know we do in undergraduate work and then in seminary work and even clear on up to PhD work and beyond is to find and follow and pursue and equip and be equipped for the work God's given us to do. And so it goes something like this in Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, right? That we were dead in sin and loving it. Walking like the others, but God sent His Son. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works lest anyone should boast. And we often stop there. But verses 9 and 10 say, so that we might do the good works God had prepared beforehand for us to do. God created human beings to work and to do His work. 
and to be satisfied in it and to be joyous in it. So I want us to take a look at our part in this using as models Isaiah, the servant of the Lord in the famous passages that are rightly considered messianic passages. And then a plural group, the servants who appear in Isaiah. And so we're going to be using uh, our Bibles and I'll be trying to read uh, for you some passages. I'll be reading for English Standard Version. Um, Isaiah, I believe, had already been a prophet for some time by the time we get to chapter 6. God has had him preaching about the vineyard. He's been preaching about the judgment of God. He's been preaching with an aim during Uzziah's kingship to turn people back to God. In chapter 6 and verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, things are about to change drastically because the Assyrian Empire, which is already dominating north and east and uh, north and west of Israel and Judah, is about to dominate their region too. Uzziah was the last king. Though he suffered under the hands of Assyria, he was the last king who was able to keep his people free and not being vassals of this foreign power. Things are about to change and his ministry is going to change. And he's going to start learning an interesting and important lesson that we would do well to be reminded of and to remind ourselves of each other. And that is we do not pick the times in which we live. You might prefer to live back in the 19th century, the 18th century. I might prefer to live back in the 20th century. I, I kind of knew it fairly well. And now I'm a stranger in a new millennium. Well, I don't get to choose. My parents, more or less, in the power of God, decided what times I would live in. He's living in a time in which Judah's about to get swept up in history if they don't turn to the Lord. So these are the times, and all of this will affect our friend Isaiah as he goes forward. In the year that King Uzziah died, about 740 BC, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. We sang about that throne a minute ago, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe, or the hem of his robe, you know, just this, this bottom part of whatever robe you're wearing, just this, this bit of it filled the temple. And the temple, as you know, was about 90 by 30, three stories high. That's a pretty big individual with a big, big robe. You're already beginning to get a sense of the scope of what he's about to see. Above him stood the seraphim. The burning ones, these are not chubby, flat, fat, floating little cherubs, as we will see. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And they're zipping back and forth, one calling to the other, holy, 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 different, different, different is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. Tiglath-Pileser III, the king of, of uh, Syria, has lots of inscriptions in which he says he's the king, the great king, the king of kings, the king of all kings, king of the east, king of the west, king of the north, king of the south, king, 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 king. Yeah, they were humble, the Assyrians. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, they've instructed our own politicians sometimes. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. He's the real one, the whole earth. He's the real king. He's full of his glory, of his magnitude, of his heaviness, of his greatness. This is the king. And the thresholds of the, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of the one who called, and the house was filled with smoke. I do not wish to be in an earthquake. The testimonies I've heard of people who are have satisfied my curiosity. The building began to shake, and the smoke fills the room, and the king has not even spoken yet. These are his lieutenants, his, his, well, he's not really a bodyguard, is he? Who are those seraphim protecting? They're keeping Isaiah safe. Back, buddy, back, buddy. There is a God here who is holy, holy, holy. Different, different, different. He fills the earth with his glory. He's the real king. And as a place fills with smoke and the thing shakes, verse 5, Isaiah said, I said, woe is me, I am... I am lost. 
or I'm undone, I'm unclothed, I'm a man of unclean lips. Bad thing for a prophet, right? My mouth's not right. I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. We certainly saw that yesterday in chapter 1. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Now, I like that little bit. I, I always want to hasten on to where verse 7, Behold, this has touched your lip, your guilt's taken away, your sin's atoned for. So we have this six-winged burning thing with, a, with holding tongs with a bit of a fiery coal in the tongs flying straight at Isaiah for his lips. I'm pretty impressed that he stood in there and took it, even if it's just, just a vision. And the coal cleanses his lips. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And since a lot of the missionary messages I've heard in my time end at verse 8, I'm going to stop for a moment to pause to tell you that what we've seen so far is God rules His world and His work. He is the Creator of the heavens and the earth. His kingship is our motive for sharing His work. He is the King, and for those of you of a certain temperament, he, has, he will say to you, I am your authority, here's how you live your life. For those of us who are of different temperament and say, well, you know, I, I need direction, He is the authority who gives us direction for His life. The fact that He is King is our motive for sharing His work. This is tremendously hard for Americans because I, I understand a, few, a couple centuries ago there was a war fought so that we wouldn't have a King. Americans don't like to bow to anybody. We're going to do our own thing. There's a King and we follow Him. And our passport is one that He issues. He must be our primary ruler. No Christian can truly say America first or the UK first or anything else first. We must say Yahweh first, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus first. We, we belong to a different kingdom. And everything flows through that ministry of that king. This king in verses 5 to 7 humbles us. No one in their right mind is going to try to stand up and thump their chest before God. Isaiah, who was a great, creative, bold person already, is bowing before this king, knowing he is not worthy unless the king says so to stand before him. Remember Esther, who was afraid to go in to her husband because he had not called for her, and she must go before the king and see if he will receive her? It's like that. Humble before him. Now, when you humble before God, he instructs you. Let's look at verse 8 to 13. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. Say to this people, Keep on hearing. In other words, Well, have you, have you believed chapters 1 to 4 yet? Keep on hearing, but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but don't perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What's God saying here? You've been preaching, you will continue preaching, you will do what I'm asking you to do. And I want you to know that the very offer of grace will become the means by which these people will harden their hearts. It doesn't matter if you're a Calvinist or a Wesleyan or what you are. The truth is, as you minister, when you offer grace to some people, and as they resist it, they are slowly hardening their heart against God. And there's nothing you can really do about it because you are a minister of the gospel. You're one who's giving the word and you're teaching. And yet you know somehow as you watch the face harden, as you watch the body language as you go, that this person is hardening their heart against God. There will be no great revival time in Isaiah's life. What's going to happen, he says, in this particular case, and also in Jeremiah's case, and also in Ezekiel's case, and to a large extent in Jesus' case, the people will see and not perceive, and they'll harden their hearts, and they will not turn. Jesus quotes this passage in His ministry. Paul quotes this passage in his ministry. There will come a time when you will realize that though you have been faithfully proclaiming the gospel and carefully discipling people according to the Word of God and equipping them, though you have been in that process, there will be some who will harden their hearts. 
and it is a grievous thing. We should never take satisfaction in it. We must never take joy in it. Isaiah is going to go minister now for a few more decades, and he never takes joy or assumes that the people will harden their hearts or that he will know who they are. He is giving God's Word. So he says, verse 11, how long? Until cities lie waste without inhabitants and houses without people and the land's a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. By chapter 36 and verse 1, another 30 years have passed. The Assyrians have come into the land and as God promised, everything but Jerusalem itself is devastated, harmed, exiled, and so forth. He says, you're going to preach until there is just a little bit left of the country. And it'll be Zion because that's the most important place. But that's what's going to happen to you. Until this happens, until God's judgment has, and His, and his disciplining hand upon His people has happened, then verse 13, and though a tenth remain in it, it'll be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it's felled, and the holy seed is its stump. It's like this in Isaiah's time. Imagine your congregation like a great oak tree cut down, and this is, this is of course how you do it. Some of you know this. You cut it down and you haul it away. I helped my dad just a few years ago do, do this task. We had done it a couple of times before, but growing up, but I was a grown man. I was watching. You cut it down, and then dad said, okay, let's get the axes. And we got the axes. We chopped up the stump, you see, and to beat the stump, and we took the chips out of that. And then you put some fire down in there, and you burn the stump as low as it would go. This is what this is talking about. Why? Because you don't want the tree to grow back, right? And so the Assyrians are going to cut it as low as they can. They're going, to, they're going to bring it as low as they possibly can. And yet, according to verse 13, Isaiah, there's wonderful news. The holy seed is in its stump. There is yet a remnant. There is yet a group. There is yet a holy people. And as I think about all the, some of the messages I heard growing up about um, trying to get us to go uh, to be foreign missionaries in general. Um, they often made it sound like we were going to be going on holiday and riding elephants for fun. And I, I, don't, I don't know what all. Now, I, I want to hasten to say these messages were typically not brought to us by veteran missionaries. As I talk to veteran missionaries and as I read missionary biographies, I am stunned by what people like Adoniram Judson or William Carey did. Or how many missionaries got close to the shore and lost their possessions in a shipwreck. Or how many other modern day missionaries, some of them on your faculty, who have found out what it's like to suffer a great deal, to go outside of culture and serve God. What do I know as surely as I know they suffered and did God's will? They were out there finding the remnant of God. Their holy seed is in his stump. Jesus says, there are other disciples I have not yet, I will still call. But I want us to see that our motive is not the numerical success. Our motive cannot be that you will be a great successful prophet. Your motive cannot be, I would like to publish my stuff in the Bible like Isaiah. Our motive must be the king has sent us. The methods must be his methods. Because you cannot separate the end result from the methods and the means that you use. We only think we can use the different methods that are not God's and somehow have it come out clean. Isaiah is told to take God's word, and when God sends him to the king in chapter 7, that's where he goes. In chapter 8, when God tells him, it's time for you to be isolated and to teach the disciples I've given you. Chapter 8, verse 15 and 16. That's what he does. And so Isaiah in so many ways shows us, shows us a model for self-sacrificing service so that Jesus and Paul would look to this section of chapter 6 and say, 
We understand our ministry now because of that text. We understand it. And I think Isaiah was ready for numerical success. If God had granted it, I think he was ready to go. It was simply his time, his place. His faithfulness was what God required. Well, what about the servant himself? We, let's go to chapter 42. It's interesting in, the, in chapter 42, it's interesting that in the Bible, there are only a handful of people who are given the special title God's servant. Moses is one of them, David's one of them, Abraham's one of them, Jacob's one of them. Mary asked that she be called just a servant of the Lord. Paul says, I am a servant of God. The doulos of Christ, the doulos of God. That was what he was trying to be. Job is called God's servant. But also people like Eliakim, believe it or not, in Isaiah 22, a guy who serves the king. He's a servant of God. David himself is the servant of God who would become the father of the lineage of the servant of God. But Israel is called the servant of God as well in chapter 41. Israel in the Bible is God's servant and so is David. Throughout the Bible, the two are both characters in the story. Therefore, when we get to the servant songs of Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 52, so-called servant song, we need to understand that there has always been in the biblical story, not a problem saying who's the one servant who fits every single description, but that Israel has been God's servant, but God has a servant to the servant. How's Israel doing as a servant of God? Chapter 41, verse 8. Well, they've been overrun by the Assyrians. They've not been terribly faithful. They're completely discouraged. So verse 8, but you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, you're my servant. I've chosen you, not cast you off. Fear not, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In 42, he continues to encourage them. He has a servant who will come to them. Behold, my servant who I'm upholding, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him, and he'll bring justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all who comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it, I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am Yahweh, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. The Creator has said to His entire kingdom, His entire creation, I'm sending a servant. And He's the one who's going to bring righteousness to the nation, justice to the nations, that which we've always longed for. But we look at chapter 42 and verses 2 and 3. He's a humble servant king. The characteristics of chapter 42 are the same ones found in chapter 11. And here he's told, we're told that this is a humble servant king like David was. And notice in verses 42, I'm sorry, chapter 42, verses 2 and 3, which is quoted in Matthew 12, isn't it? The servant's not bringing attention to himself. He's not doing everything he can to draw others to him by calling out in the street and doing these things. So it's very interesting how Matthew quotes this, that Jesus is telling people who have, convict, who have been converted to him to not go and tell the story. And then Matthew cites this as if saying, you see, Jesus wasn't about promoting himself. Jesus was not about, how can I put it in current terms? 
Jesus was not about branding his ministry. Jesus was not about figuring a way to make himself famous. He was about making God known. I love the Gospel of John over and over again. Jesus is saying, look, I'm just doing my father's work. I'm working for dad. And I want you to know who my father is. And I want to go back to my father. And I want to bring you to meet my father. And at some point he says, boy, you know, it's going to be a lot better for you. I'm going to go away and send the spirit. Jesus was a humble man. Jesus kept pointing to the others. And of course, the spirit always points to Jesus. And God points to the son and to the spirit. They're all the Trinity. And I, I'm sorry, I know anytime I talk about the Trinity, I know one way or the other, I'm committing some sort of church history heresy. I just don't know which one I'm doing as I try to describe the Trinity. But do you notice how humble Jesus is? Humility needs to become increasingly an earmark of the ministers of Jesus Christ. We're not always known for that, are we? In parts because, you know, people are kind to us. We're not careful. You know, Bruce gave me a nice introduction. I appreciated that. Most of what he says was factually accurate. It was very, very kind, very decent. And it was offered in a good spirit, and I took it that way. If we're not careful, though, we'll start saying, what a big deal I am. There'll be plenty of people in the churches who will try to keep you humble, so if you're not careful, you'll try to exalt yourself. If you're married to a, to a clergyman, if you're not very careful, you get defensive for the sake of your spouse and do everything you can to give them power. Jesus let the Father give the power. Jesus was not shrinking back from brisk dialogue. He was not getting pushed around, but Jesus had no intention of exalting himself above the Father. How is it with you? The Creator has stretched out the heavens and the earth. He's given us a servant to proclaim. Do we make him first? Chapter 49. Chapter 49, verse 1, is a point at which God sends his servant, I believe this is the heir of David, to his servant Israel to help it. And that is the biblical story. God sends <clears throat> his son to Abraham's descendants. Chapter 49, verse 1, listen to me, O coastland, give attention to you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said, you're my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my rights with the Lord, my recompense with God. Now verse 5, big transition. Now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob, that is Israel, but that other servant back to him. That Israel might be gathered to him, that I, for I'm honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. <laughs> too light a thing to achieve what all the prophets worked their guts out for decades to achieve. That's too light a thing for this servant. He's capable of doing more work. He's, he's able to do even more. I'll make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. That was also promised in chapter 42, to the nations, to the peoples, to all people that God created. This missionary servant reconciles God's people to God and then brings light to the nations. In this book and in the New Testament, however, it is through the work of the servants that the servant chooses and equips that the, the word goes out. 
The Apostle Paul in Acts 13 is giving a great gospel sermon, and he's giving it in a synagogue, and he's giving it to people who are aware of the Old Testament, and he's giving it to people who are Jews and who are God fears. And so he starts with Abraham, and he runs the story of creation, the story of people of God to the point of David. He tells them God has promised the son of David. He tells them who Jesus is. So he starts with Abraham, and he gives this great gospel message. And the Jewish people he's talking to there reject this story, reject this call, reject Jesus. And he says, well, the Gentiles who are in the group, probably the god fears, they want to hear more, so we're going to talk to them. And then he quotes this passage, Isaiah 49. And he says, basically, I'm God's servant taking the servant's message to the ends of the earth. The missionary Paul got his idea for what kind of missionary he ought to be from Isaiah 49. Other passages too, but right here he quotes. Now then, he reconciles God's people to God and brings light to the nations. Turn to chapter 50 to the next chapter and to another servant. Another servant image, all of which come together. Verse 4, the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I listened to God and I've taught the people. That's what I've been doing. Listening to God, teaching the people morning by morning. Verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I've not been disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint. I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. So who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness have no light. Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all of you kindle a fire who equip yourself with burning torches. Walk by the light of your fire and by the torches you've kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. It's a mini version of what we read in chapter 65 yesterday. This servant saying, I was faithful to open my mouth and teach God's people, even through persecution, even through striking, even through trouble. This is a persevering, suffering, persecuted prophet's servant. He keeps on teaching God's Word. Understand that God determines what we do with our lives and where we go. As I said yesterday, a lot of you will be long to go to to foreign countries to share the gospel, and many of you will do that. God put it in your heart. Some of you long to do that, and God will tell you what He told the man He cast out the demon. You go home and tell. You go home and tell. James, the brother of Jesus, spent his ministry in Jerusalem, right? Right up to the end of the time when it fell in 70 AD, ministering to the city where, where he had lived his life. If tradition is correct, and I like it a lot, Thomas went to India. I wonder if he's, all the old jokes come out. He got on the boat and said, I wonder if we can get there. Or maybe Thomas just said, you know what? I once doubted something I never should have doubted. And hey, we're not only going to get to India, we're going to get there on time. I don't know. But he, by tradition's sake, was taken far away. And then Jesus, you know, is instructing, Jesus raised from the dead, instructing the disciples, and I love it, he says to Peter, you know, three times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And by the way, he says, when you get old, you're, they're going to haul you away where you don't want to go. And he points to John, doesn't he? Hey, and what about him? <laughs> and Jesus basically said, what's it to you? That's not up to you, but you go feed my sheep. Don't compare yourself to John. Don't be upset at his ministry. Don't wish you had what somebody else had. 
And for goodness sakes, if you faithfully followed God's will, don't go to one of these conferences that tells you if your church is not twice the size of the amount of human beings in a four state area that you've got, that you are a bad minister of Jesus Christ. If you're faithful and God gives you 40 people in a 40 person town, if you're faithful and God gives you, help us all, two or 3,000 people in a million person town like my pastor serves, we're going to be faithful. We're going to be faithful. God chooses that. You are to go wherever God tells you to go, to serve however God calls you to serve, but His sovereignty is primary. And by the way, how does He have you do this? By being a persevering teaching pastor. What are some of the standards for being a pastor? I've read lots of books that puzzle me because they don't talk about the things the Bible talks about. The Bible says, are you hospitable? Are you not a brawler? Are you able to manage your household well? Are you a learner? Are you apt to teach? Apostle John put it this way, do you love the brothers and sisters? One of the things that irritates me about certain models of church that are disembodied is that I take offense for people like you because the truth is, if I've got my head on right and my heart toward God, if you are a faithful person who meets those qualifications, who will teach me and my family the Bible, I have no excuse not to listen to you. I don't need to beam in somebody famous from somewhere. I have no reason not to listen to you who, by the way, would actually touch me and touch my family and be there incarnationally. I take offense for young students, not just because I was one, but because according to the Bible, if you meet the standards, the Lord can use you and I ought to hear that. You know that in chapter 52 and chapter 53, as I speak to you today on Ash Wednesday, and lots of Christians around the world are thinking about entering into a period of thinking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I hope you know Isaiah 53 well. God calls His servant. It startles the nations. He calls him to die. And yet by verse 10, having died for our sins, he will see his offspring having justified us, yet He will rise again, is the effect of this passage. And Jesus puts it this way for us, having understood and maybe read chapter 52 and 53 from time to time, you would understand that this shows us the death of Christ. You would see how the New Testament writers shape their stories of the cross according to the events in order of this passage. And you know what this is about? bring your mind in this and every other season to the following fact. Jesus said, anyone who comes after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. We are a cross-bearing bunch. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way, when God calls a man, he calls him, come and die. Die to self, die to what your actual personal plans are, God may give them back to you, but die to those things. Jesus calls us to be cross bearers. And that means we will suffer for the sins of others in ministry. We'll suffer for the sins of others in seminary. We'll suffer for the sins of others in faculty meetings. We'll suffer for the sins and we will bear those sins for one another. And we will take the cross to the world. The Christian's power is in the cross and in the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what Isaiah is teaching us. The servants that he then mentions, we read yesterday, as you come to chapter 66, we find this group of servants who are taking God's message to the ends of the earth. If you look at chapter 65, the text tells us particularly in chapter 65 and verses 1 to 16, my servants who trust in me, I will protect, I will lead, I will guide, and I will give them the new heavens and the new earth. And I will myself bring them home 
What is their heritage? I took you too far. Go back to chapter 54. What's their heritage? Remember how Peter said to Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. What's there for us? Oh, he said, more lands, more families, more people. Basically Christians and the new heavens and the new earth. But verse 16, behold, I've created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. I've also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon that's fastened against you shall succeed. And this is all in the context of Zion. And you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, that their vindication or their righteousness from me, says the Lord. That's your heritage. Safety at home. Who's your family? Chapter 56, let's look at it. Having told Judah that they're part of the family, having told Israel they're part of the family, 56.3. Let not the foreigner who joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath, who chooses the things that please me and holds fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and name better than sons and daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. I think Jesus liked that one. He quotes it. Who's your family? People from all nations, races, tongues. Read Revelation and see all those people standing before the throne. And I want you to understand their family. And amongst the people of God, this does give us some interesting obligations and opportunities to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ the way we treat, if we treat them well, our physical brothers and sisters. I have not, I'm not mad at my brother. I, I, I have one surviving brother. I, and I, we grew up together a year apart in school and everything, very close and things. And we're not mad at one another. We just hadn't talked for a while. He lives in Costa Rica. And if, and if people think I'm evasive by not having a telephone and I'm hard to find, you should see my brother. He's, he's 60 years old and probably surfing as we speak. Now I have to stop for a moment and pray about my envy problem. But anyway, uh, you know, that's where, that's where he is. If he called right now, my wife knows how to get to him. The messenger came right in right now and said, Joel needs fill in the blank. What do you do for your brother? Uh, have three sisters, really close to one, very fond in touch with the other two. Suzanne, Sarah, and this is actually her name, Sunday needs. Fill in the blank. What would you do for your brother and sister? What would you do for family? You and I are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the body of Christ on earth. We will spend eternity together, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. For we'll be in a new heavens and new earth, right? What's that? look like. One of his Sabbath poems, Wendell Berry, trying to conceive of it, knowing he's not worthy of it, writes the following. Heaven enough for me would be this world as I know it, but redeemed of our abuse of it and one another. It would be the heaven of knowing again. There's no marrying in heaven, and I submit, even so, I would like to know my wife again both of us young again, and I remembering how I loved her when she was old. I would like to know my children again, all my family, all my dear ones, to see, to hear, to hold more carefully than before, to study them lingeringly as one studies old verses, committing them to heart forever. 
I would like again to know my friends, my old companions, men and women, horses and dogs in all the ages of our lives here in this place that I've watched over all my life in all its moods and seasons, never enough. I will be leaving how many beauties overlooked. That's just part of it. But we imagine it, and Isaiah imagined it through the power of the Holy Spirit as a new heaven, a new earth, completely what it ought to be. This is our home. This is where our family will live. And God who's given us this international family has given us an international mission according to what we've already read in Isaiah 66. Well then, what a privilege. What a privilege. God has given us work to do. God, in an age in which we are worried about employment, has given us employment to do, sometimes for money. God, who knows that we are getting older, and God, who knows that our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents are very old, still has work for them to do. It came to me in a flash, perhaps of insight. Students said, uh, my dad or granddad, I can't remember which it is, he's a Christian, but he's, he's dying, he knows that he's depressed, he's been irritable, he's doing these sort of things, I want you to pray for him. And, and then the student said, do you have any advice for him? I thought that was strange. I said, tell him it's his job to teach his family how to die. I thought I'd overstepped. I was nervous, but <laughs> The guy came back a few days later. He said, Dad or Grandpa, I forget which it was. He said, thank you. He feels great. He now knows what his task is. He has a job to do. He will show his family how a man dies in faith. Always a job to do. Always something that God would give us to do. And that is such good news because he also calls us to rest on a regular basis. As I think about the servants of the Lord, I confess that I've been greatly moved over the last 35 or more years now by Dietrich Bonhoeffer's legacy as he teaches some of these passages. He says amazing, amazing things. But one of the things he says about Christian ministry is the following. A truth, a doctrine, or religion need no space for themselves. They are disembodied entities. They're heard, learned, and apprehended, and that's all. It's also important to him. But the incarnate Son of God needs not only ears and hearts, but living men and women who will follow him. That is why he called disciples into a literal bodily following and thus made his fellowship with them a visible reality. He's called you to put a body on ministry and to share with one another as he finishes his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, the end of the Sermon on the Mount echoes the beginning. The words of the last judgment is foreshadowed in the call to discipleship. But from beginning to end, it is always his word, his call, his alone. If we follow Christ, cling to his word and let everything else go, it will see us through to the day of judgment. What do people need? He writes, what they need is good shepherds, good pastors. Feed my lambs is the last charge Jesus gave to Peter. The good shepherd protects his feet, sheep against the wolf, and instead of fleeing, he gives his life for the sheep. He knows them all by name and loves them. He knows their distress and their weakness. He leads them gently, not sternly to pasture. He leads them on the right way. He seeks the one lost sheep. He brings it back to the fold. What about the people of God? Even as the confessing church shrank and shrank and shrank into a tiny minority in Nazi Germany said, quote, there are still people praying and waiting for God in every place. And those people will give the disciples humble and cheerful welcome in the name of the Lord. They will support their work with their prayers. Indeed, they're a little flock already in being, the advanced guard of the whole church of God. And there'll be plenty of people who will say the strategic thing to do is to make sure, I suppose, that somebody staff those little churches and somebody do something for that, that sad bunch of people. Bonhoeffer took those students who had done a full theology degree, who knew Greek and Hebrew and theology, and he trained them in that six-month program that's described in the book, uh, Cost Discipleship and Life Together, knowing that many of them were going to churches of eight and ten people. We don't skimp on what we put into our people because of the size of the flock, because we don't know the future of the size of the flock. 
and because sheep are still sheep and still need a shepherd. The good news is, and I take heart in this, there are people who are there who want to hear from you, who want to receive the ministry. There are folks out there. And so even in crisis times, these things are true. So I have to ask you, there are lots of models of ministry out there. Many of them are so connected to our culture's view of what a big man or woman is that it's frightening to compare. God says to you, it's enough for us to be like Jesus, to be like the servant, to be Bible-saturated, Spirit-filled, humble servants of God. It's enough. And if it's enough, and if we use our differing gifts to be able to do things, we can have ministry that's faithful to God to one or two people, or one or two thousand, or one or two million people. But if we're trying to do the wrong thing, and to get God to serve our career, or to get the church to serve our career, or to get the seminary to serve our career, I greatly fear, as Bonhoeffer once put it, you will not advance in the right direction by running to the rear of a moving train. Go the right direction from the start. Commit to the service of God, and the gospel will follow as you bring others who trust Christ and you disciple that you will see in Zion, and it will be a nice reunion. Let's pray. Father in heaven, for these brothers and sisters who are teaching and learning and serving alongside one another here in this place, I ask your richest blessing. Would you please link them to the ministries that they're doing through your walk with them and their walk with you and the fellowship of one another. Would you link all of this in the name of Jesus for the kingdom's sake. Thank you for what you teach us. Thank you for how you lead us. May we grow and develop and encourage one another today in Christ's name. Amen.